Good afternoon. We welcome to the afternoon services here at the Walnut Grove Church of Christ, and we welcome our visitors and those that are joining us by way of live stream. We're certainly glad to have you as well. I encourage you to be with us. We remind you of our services Wednesday night at 6.30 and then next Sunday morning at 9.30. Just a couple announcements. I did not have any to add to the list, uh, but you are sympathies extended to the family of Galen Riley and asked him that visitation Tuesday night is five to eight and it will be at the Life Celebration Center of Philbeck and Can, what was the Marshall County Library. So there's where the visitation will occur. Uh, otherwise, Tuesday is our senior luncheon and also the little dresses and Friday we have uh, ramp 177 at 630 at JoJo's and then next weekend is our Christian evidences, and the next weekend is Lads the Leaders. So lots of things on the calendar. Are there any other announcements that need to make, be made before we start our services? Larry? If I can make this known, we will win on the announcements between Saturday and uh, Sunday. Uh, we'll have a seminar. We'll Nothing else, Jeff? Wait a minute. Okay, so after services this afternoon, Larry needs to meet with those preparing food for the Christian Evidences Seminar. Corey needs to meet with the parents of those going to Lads the Leaders. So two meetings to put now after services today. Anything else? Jeff. First song this afternoon, 449. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Next page over, number 450. 450. This time we'll have our opening prayer. Let us pray. Our most righteous Heavenly Father, once again we come before your throne. We thank you for this Lord today that we're having here in this beautiful weather that we're having. We thank you so much for our young people who we just witnessed that the church is in good hands in the future and let us set a good example for them that they may carry on the work of the church long after we're gone and we know that that, that uh, their efforts are pure and, and we appreciate them so much. Father, be with those who are experiencing health problems that they may... Uh, gain their health back that they can get back to their regular walks of life and get back to, to where they can assemble with the saints and we ask the blessings upon the doctors and those who are helping out with them and ministering to them that they they may also have success father we ask your blessings upon the missionaries that are abroad maybe in in harm's way possibly that they in difficult situations that you be with them as they try to spread the borders of your kingdom and we know that also that that right next door to us can be a mission field that there are many people here in our own country state and even county and town that are not 
Christians and that we can do our part to, to further the cause of the gospel. We thank you so much, as always, that you sent your son to this earth to die a horrible, cruel death to, as a, a sacrifice for our sins and that we are able to, through obedience to your will, have a hope of spending eternity with you in heaven. And we are so thankful for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We haven't sung this song in a long time. I heard it on the radio the other day. I thought, well, we need to do that. The way that he loves. Song of further encouragement, number 800, Zion's Call. Brother Jason. Good afternoon. It's good to see everyone this afternoon. Thank you for being in our afternoon Bible study. And by the way, if you are not included in one of the meetings that have been announced and, and you want a meeting, I'll be right out here in the back. You don't have to be left out. We've been talking about the Psalms for a while now and thinking about how different observations in our reading give us ways to use the Psalms in our own devotional reading and prayer life. So we see something going on, we say, I can, I can do that too. I could dwell on God's greatness or rehearse His saving works. And so what we did is by these observations, we built a toolbox, so to speak, and I hope our approach has been helpful. And if anything, it's, it's designed point us, to point us back to the Word of God and to use it 
in our personal lives for our own strength and enrichment. And I think they help us pray and persevere. And so we have scriptures that are already in prayer form or song form. In other words, they're addressed to God. We can take these and they are ready-made prayers and we can identify with many of the things that are found therein. So today we're going to add another tool. It'll be our last in this afternoon's study. Uh, not our last class, but the last tool in this list. So as we reflect upon it, I'll show you again the list so far, and number seven now will be look to Jesus. So we can take the Psalms, we can do any one of these particular spiritual exercises and use the Psalms for our own enrichment, including look to Jesus. You remember this passage from Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2? The secret, you might say, to running the race with endurance is to do so looking to Jesus. How do I do that? You know, on Monday when things are not going well or at some point in my life, how do I live my Christian life and I'm trying to endure? How do I look to Jesus? Because we know it is not literally, physically putting our eyes on Him, but it is somehow mentally and spiritually that I can focus on Him and receive encouragement and be steadfast by looking to Him. Well, the clue in the verse itself is, we look to Jesus who, for the joy set before Him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. Now, I think about who He is and what He went through for me. And that training my mind, that focus of my mind on that reality is encouraging. Well, what we're saying is, I can do that with the Psalms. I can look to Jesus and think about who He is and what He did with the Psalms. In other words, this belongs in our toolbox as we think about using the Psalms for our own spiritual enrichment, how they can help us pray and persevere. I'll ask you to think about this passage then. Jesus is talking to the apostles, after his resurrection, and among the many things he said to them, he said this, These are my words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must needs be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Did the Psalms speak about Jesus? Well, of course. That's what Jesus said. And so we're going to find places in the Psalms where prophetically Jesus is spoken about. In other words, just like Isaiah or just like some other prophecy, so in the Psalms written hundreds of years before Jesus came, we find references to Him. And along these two areas, we find references to who is this one God is sending? Who is He? And then, what will He do? So we could read Psalms that talk about who Jesus is and Psalms that talk about what He would do. So that's the direction we'll be going. Identifying Messianic Psalms and particularly, once we identify them and look at them, how do they help us look to Jesus and be encouraged? So, a couple of interesting observations, I think, about this matter. There are 79 quotations from the book of Psalms in the New Testament. 
Now, not all of those relate to Christ, but it is just an interesting detail that the Psalms, in general, is quoted that much in the New Testament. Now, anytime we use a, a number to say, now, this is how many quotations there are, that's a little bit difficult to pin down. And here's why. There are a number of verses in the New Testament that will use language right out of a psalm where a writer just kind of works it into what he's saying without making a quotation. In other words, when we read in the New Testament something like, and it said in the Psalms, quote, it's clearly a quotation. And so when we say 79 quotations, we're really talking about those real firm quotations that are identified as such. But this number doesn't even begin to touch all of the illusions, not illusions, the allusions, the references to Psalms. And so we can point some of those out along the way too. But there's a lot of use of the book of Psalms in the New Testament. So we can identify which one of these quotations have to do with Christ. and We'll see some of that today. And which ones, therefore, are referring to Him. I wanted to recall with you this question from Job. I don't know if you remember this or not back a long time ago, about a year ago, when we were in this neighborhood of the book of Job. We noted that as Job explained his struggle, he said a number of things. And we had one class that was particularly about, hey, let's listen to Job. Let's just listen and identify in different places in the book of Job what he's going through, which is always a helpful thing when we're trying to be an encouragement to someone, to actually listen and know what it is they're feeling. So, of course, the first part of the book of Job gives us what he was going through, but we identified other things that he said, so we're listening to him as he talks about it. This brings us back to Job 9.33. Job lamented this. There is no arbiter between us. If you're reading from the King James, what does it say? Daysman. What's Job saying? Well, he's talking about someone who would plead his case, who could kind of be in the middle. There is no, the ESV says, arbiter between us who might lay his hand on us both. So Job is making a statement about a, a kind of feeling or grievance. And between him and God... There's nobody in the middle. And we pointed out at the time that that's exactly the role Jesus would fill. Would He not? As He is our mediator. As He is our advocate with the Father. 1 John 2 and verse 2. So here's what we're doing. We can go to the Psalms and we can read about prophetically the one who would come and be in the middle. The one that Job wished he had. Well, he would have. There would be one coming who would, on behalf of us, plead our case to God, so to speak. And so that's what we're doing when we go to these Psalms. We're seeing Jesus in the middle. And so these Messianic Psalms are both descriptive and prophetic. Meaning, since they're written ahead of time, 
They're looking forward. They're prophetic. But they are descriptive. Very unique. Because in some of them, Jesus is actually speaking. They're in the first person. It's not just a prophet talking about him third hand, but they are quotations from Jesus in a prophetic context. And you and I get to think about, here's the one who came to be in the middle. Here's our arbiter. Here's our advocate. And these psalms kind of enrich our thinking about the things Jesus thought and did and who he was. So they fulfill a unique role in our appreciation of the Lord. Now, of course, our primary information for learning about Jesus is the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then, of course, all the other information in Acts and the letters and the book of Revelation. But we can't leave this out. These beautiful psalms that can be a tool for us, giving us direction on how to look to Jesus and gain encouragement. So, what do we find? We find the answer even in the psalms to these two questions. Who is Jesus and what will he do? That is, prophetically, what would he do? Now we're going to go to Psalm 2 today to get a sample of what we're talking about. And we will find that Psalm chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 are quoted in Acts 4. We will find that Psalm 2, 7 is quoted in Acts 13, 33 and also in Hebrews twice. So if you would, go with me to Psalm 2 first and then... After looking at that for just a second, we're going to look at the New Testament passages. Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot a vain thing or in vain? That's not a question like out of curiosity. I wonder why. It's more like, can you believe it? Why in the world? That's kind of the feeling behind this question as the text reveals. It is an insane thing to set yourself against God. That's just not a brilliant idea. Why in the world do the nations rage and the peoples meditate or plot in vain? You see that word vain? That identifies what this raging or what this rebellion really is in the end. It's a vain attempt to rebel against God. Now that that's what we're talking about. The text reveals. So, verse 2 says, The kings of the earth set themselves. What does it mean when we say about someone that they're digging their heels in? What does that mean? Right. They are being defensive and resistant and, and they are now as a similar expression is, they're going to double down on their position. Even though they have been shown another way, no, they, they have their mind made up. The kings of the earth dig their heels in. And the rulers conspire. Now let me just, let me just ask a question because this is a messianic psalm. And like many other Messianic Psalms, it was something even in its day applicable, but it really foreshadowed something larger. Kind of like the Passover lamb was something real in its day, but it foreshadowed something greater. So let me ask you, the rulers in Jesus' day, 
Did they ever have any evidence that Jesus was the Christ? Was there ever anything that suggested that Jesus was the Christ? But they dug their heels in. And they conspired. They plotted. They took counsel together. Notice the latter part of verse 2. Against the Lord and against His anointed. As Jesus said, if you reject me, you reject Him that sent me. Okay, we remember those things that kind of echo these thoughts here. So there were these rulers who were against the Lord by being against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. We're done with being submissive to God and to His anointed. Now you see a transition in verse 4. Thinking about this vain rebellion, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. God has said, I've put my king in place. And to resist him is vain. Doesn't matter what you counsel together about. Doesn't matter what you plot. I have set my king on my holy hill. And that's what I have decreed. God has said that. Now here's another little transition in verse 7. There's the description of the rebellion. There is God's response. Now what is in verse 7? Who's speaking? I will tell of the decree. I will repeat what was decreed. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. The Lord said to me, The me here, or the speaker, beginning in this verse, is Jesus Christ. The Lord said to me, you are my son. This day have I begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. This is continuing to quote what God the Father said to the Son. I will give you the the nations. You shall break them with a rod of iron. Now, I'll just put a footnote on here. Remember I said a minute ago, it's kind of hard to quote the quotations of Psalms in the New Testament. If we get a list where we just have this real, definite, explicit, and this is what was said by David in Psalm 2. Okay, that's clearly a quotation. Three times in the book of Revelation, there are allusions to this verse, or an echo. Three times, it's just kind of folded into statements in the book of Revelation that Jesus rules with a rod of iron. That's one of those things, it's not really a direct quotation, but it's clearly appealing to the language of the psalm and incorporating that truth into a New Testament statement. Anyway, that's an example of that. The Father said to the Son, You shall, those opposing you, those resisting you, those nations rebelling, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now here comes another transition. In lieu of God putting His Son on the throne to rule the world, 
Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry, and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in Him. Blessed are those who what? Take refuge in Him. Who is the Him of this verse? It is the Lord Jesus Christ. And He is the Son whom God the Father says should be honored. Kiss the Son. What does that mean? Get down on your knee and show Him the respect He deserves. He is the ruler of heaven and earth. As we read in the book of Revelation, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's who He is. So, those who seek Him and find refuge in Him, they are going to be blessed. So that's just a survey of the material of the psalm. Let's go to the New Testament quotations for just a minute. So first, go to Acts 4 with me. You know what's really, I think, helpful and powerful about this quotation from Psalm 2 and Acts 4, 24 and 25? It is exactly what we're talking about this afternoon. The early church did exactly what we are suggesting. They got encouragement from this prophecy. And so it is quoted by them. And saying, hey, look at this. This is what was said a long, long time ago. And this gave them courage. Now what's going on in Acts chapter 4? What's going on is that Peter and John have been threatened. They healed the man that was laid at the gate of the temple, Acts 3. They got in trouble about this because they're preaching in the name of Jesus, Acts 4. They get released and they come and they tell the church what all's going on. And it's in this context that this appeal is made to this verse. Notice in Verse 23, when they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. See that, Acts 4, 23? Peter and John were released. They went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voice together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers who gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed, now look at verse 27. For truly in this city they together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel what did they do? They were gathered together in this city against Jesus, your anointed, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now God had planned that His servant, the Lamb, bear our sins. Now it didn't force Pilate's hand. God had a plan that Jesus would die for us, but those wicked people willingly became the instruments. So this doesn't say God forced them to do evil. He doesn't do that. But He had a plan and they became willing participants to carry out the death of Jesus. 
in their minds, what were they doing? What, what were they doing in their minds? That is, in the chief priests, the scribes, the Pharisees. What were they doing in their minds? Getting rid of a problem. What was Pilate doing in his mind? Getting rid of a problem. But as they intended to do evil, that very act ended up accomplishing what God had planned. Jesus would die innocent. He would die for us. Now that's that's what they're talking about. But here we have the early church doing exactly what we are saying. Look at what God said a thousand years before Christ came to this earth and died on the cross. God knew this was going to happen. God saw this coming. And when Peter and John were threatened, they appealed to this verse in a comforting way. To say, listen, nothing is going on that takes God by surprise. We read in Psalm 2, God saw all this coming. He knows that this rebellion is in vain. He knows that all efforts to rid the world of goodness and to thwart His plan are vain. What did the devil have in mind? Well, the devil's going to be crushed. He is not going to succeed in ridding the world of God's plan. And so I think it's really helpful to see how they appealed to this verse in a comforting way. God knows what's going to happen. So he can help us. He can be there for us. He's never been caught off guard or anything like that. God can see what's going to happen in as much as He can see what has happened. Let's talk about a practical application. There's a lot about how God works that's not revealed in the Bible. There's a lot about prayer that's not revealed in the Bible. We walk by faith, meaning what? Well, it's not all spelled out for us, but we trust in God. If God says, pray to me and bring your request to me and rely upon me and I hear you, we believe that and we trust Him because of who He is. But yet, it doesn't mean we we have all the answers. or It doesn't mean that, Lord, why didn't you answer this prayer? I can't see any possible reason for not answering this prayer. So we had talked about a lot of these principles back when we went through Job. But, But here's something about this song and how the early church appealed to it that I think is helpful. When we pray, we only have one point of reference with time. We live in time, right? We have a birthday, and we've been here so long, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We are bound by time. We live within time. And when we pray for help and for assistance, We are praying about things that, from our perspective, are unknown. We never inform God in prayer. He sees it all. He knows what's coming. We never say, Lord, you may not be aware of this, but here's some, you know, here's some rebellious and wicked people who are giving us a lot of trouble at work. And, and I'm here to tell you what's going on. Well, he already knows that. 
Not only does he not, not only does he know it, he knows everything in advance. And that means God can know. Now, now this is hard for us to get our minds around, and it leaves us sometimes with more questions than answers. But listen, that means God can know what I'm going to pray before I ever pray it. That means God can put into place providentially answers to prayers that had never been prayed yet. And yet sometimes we get stuck in real time and think, well, there's no need to pray about that because it's, it's already in motion. You're talking like God's in time with you. But like the early church recognized, they were living through things. They were living through events that God had talked about a thousand years before. And I can't help but think about what Paul realized when he wrote in Ephesians chapter 3, at the end of that chapter, God can do far beyond what we could even imagine. One of the reasons is, he sees everything coming. And so, never fear bringing your request to God as if somehow he is bound by time like we are. Look to Jesus, we say, Hebrews 12 and verse 2. Read Psalm 2 and see that everything he went through, God saw it coming. Well, let's make an appeal real quick to Acts chapter 13. We see again a quotation from Psalm 2. And let me just put another footnote on Psalm 2 real quick. I should have pointed out when we were over there that there is no superscription in Psalm 2 that identifies the author. So there are 73 Psalms that in superscriptions, that is that part right above verse 1, identifies David as the author. So as far as Psalm 2 is concerned, it is unknown. No author is specified. But according to Acts 4, it says that David wrote this by the Holy Spirit. So we know who wrote Psalm 2. Not because of the superscription, but because of the New Testament commentary. Now look here in Psalm, uh, uh, Acts thirteen thirty three. This he has fulfilled, that is God has fulfilled to us their children by raising Jesus as also it is written in the second Psalm. So he appeals to even the same psalm. And while in the New Testament and other places in the Old Testament, chapters and verses, right, are added in as a, an aid for our benefit, yet the psalms were independent compositions and the, the same psalm too that we have is the same psalm too they had which is an interesting reference numerically in this verse. Well, all that aside, the Bible says, and this is Paul's speech here in Antioch of Pisidia, he says that God fulfilled all of this by raising Jesus from the dead, and it is written to confirm what he just said. It's, it's a matter of prophecy. It's written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Now, Paul says that these words are fitting and applicable and fulfilling of a certain moment. And what is that? He 
He's talking about the resurrection. That Psalm 2-7 is itself a prophecy of the resurrection. How so? God said, you are my son this day. I have begotten you. Now, I'm going to ask you to, if you want to turn, fine. If you want to listen to me, I'm going to make an appeal to 1 Peter chapter 1. Where the text says this. 1 Peter 1, 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He caused us to be born again. To a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Becoming a Christian is being born again, right? Jesus talked about the new birth, except you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3, 3. So there is one way we're born, that is when we first come into this earth, But there is another way to be born. That's to be born again through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There was one moment when Jesus was born. Well, when was that? Well, when Mary gave birth to Him. And that's what Hebrews 1 and verse 5 refers to. The same passage, Hebrews 1 and 5 says, was fulfilled when He was born. But Paul says it was also fulfilled when he came back to life. That was a moment when God identified, this is my son. They killed him, but what? He's back. God raised him from the dead. And that corresponds to this decree. You are my son. This day have I begotten you. So it's fascinating that the language can refer to both his birth and his resurrection. Two days when God made a statement, he is my son. Now the resurrection was that proof on that Sunday. Hebrews 1 and verse 5 making a reference to his birth refers to another. And this is just a fascinating insight into that moment. In this text, we have an introduction speaking about God and then the Son to whom we need to listen. Who is the Son? Verse 2. The Son is the one whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds who being the effulgence of His glory and the very image of His substance, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had made purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We're talking about Jesus, His enthronement after His resurrection, after making purification for sins, sat down at the right hand of God. Having become so much better than the angels, as He has inherited a much more excellent name than they, For to which of the angels did he ever say? There's our quotation. You are my son, today I have begotten you. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. When he brought him into the world, when baby Jesus was born, if we can somehow express it like this and not do an injustice, God turned to the angels and said, worship him. That baby, worship him. And this is led into with this quotation from Psalm 2 and verse 7. Under under which of the angels did God ever say, You're my son? 
Now, what's the implied answer to that? To how many angels did, did God say that? Zero. But He said it to the Lord Jesus Christ. You are my son, this day have I begotten you. We have a similar quotation over in chapter 5 where the same passage is appealed to, again, about the uniqueness of Jesus in fulfilling a role as our high priest. So here we have an example of the kind of thing we can look for in Psalms. We can find in the New Testament quotations that are attributed to Jesus. This is what this is about, the New Testament is telling us. It gives us the ability to go back and to read it and to think about it and say, what's going on here in this psalm that now we know is about Jesus? What's going on here? Some beautiful things are going on. We see who Jesus is. He is the one and only Son of God. He is endowed by the Father with certain rights and privileges and authority. And all that, Hebrews 5 and verse 5, for our benefit. As he exercises this role of being in the middle to help us in our lives and in our journey to eternity. And along the way, we, we're called to remember everything that happens, everything we anticipate, everything we don't know and what develops. Nothing takes God by surprise. He saw everything that would happen to Jesus long before. He made plans to use it to His glory and for our benefit. So that's what we'll do. We'll look to the Psalms as they help us Look to Jesus and be encouraged to run the race with endurance. Thank you for being in our Bible study this afternoon. If we can help you in any way today and have prayer with you, this is an opportunity. You can come while we stand and sing. Zion's call sweetly rings over London City. Good to see everyone here this afternoon. Uh, do we have any other announcements we need to make before dismissed?
parents and judges last leader meeting with Corey, Larry meeting with everyone who will help with the food on Saturday this coming. Okay, that'll be good to see them there. Let's also remember our senior citizen get together Tuesday at 10 o'clock. Little dresses to follow at about one after that. If you're in our assembly today, do not have early opportunity to partake of Lord's Supper. It is left prepared for you in the room behind the baptistry here. If you'll exit during the singing of our last song, someone will be there to assist you. 431. We'll sing the first and last verses, and then we'll be dismissed in their prayer. Let's go out and make it a good week. We started off with a good day. Let's make it a good week. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day you've given us to be able to come here to study and to worship your, worship you, God, and thank you for letting us to be able to fellowship together, and God, thank you for the, the doctors and nurses that are taking care of the sick that we mentioned, and please be with the military that's fighting for our freedoms, and God, thank you for Jason coming here each Sunday to Help us understand your word, God. And most of all, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for our many sins. His name we pray. Amen.